turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. I'm sorry, chapter 5. Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. I apologize. We looked at Mark 5 last week, and we, we had a, quite an amazing story last week, didn't we? About the, uh, the demoniac, the man who was possessed by not a demon, but by thousands of demons. And Jesus, just by saying, leave, the demons fled. I love that story. That is one of my favorite stories. But what we're talking about is the same Savior. Every one of these stories is tremendous. Because we're focusing on the rightful king and heir and center of the universe and of your life and of this country and of every country and of all things in the world. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the center of it all. You know, I'll never get tired of, of talking about my Savior or, or studying or learning about my Savior because everything really is about Him and not us. Amen. So we're going to look at this today and, and with all the things we give our attention to on a weekly basis, most of those things will perish. Most of those things will end. Even the best of TV shows doesn't go on forever and ever and ever. But everything of those is, is temporary. Our Savior and the Bible is permanent and is eternal. We will be learning more and more and more about God for all eternity. So let's practice now. Let's get started now. Mark chapter 5 and verse 21. This is what we call a story within a story. A tremendous account of not only the power, but the mercy of our Lord. Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. So there is the setting to this section, okay? Now, first of all, remember, he's been going back and forth across the lake. He went from this place in 521... He went across the lake, and that's when the big storm came and arose. Remember that? And he calmed the storm with the word. They got to the other side after the storm was calmed and the lake was calm, and he encountered this demon-possessed man running down the hill to them. And there's just been a lot of things to be scared of in the disciples' world right now. Jesus had his experience with this man, cast out these demons, the man was made well. So now they're going back to the original side of the Sea of Galilee. And it says that when he crossed over again, a large crowd had gathered around him. It, it's as, almost as if the crowd was there waiting on him to get back, right? This crowd, and you'll find in the, in the Gospels, the crowd is more often than not very fickle and very easy to sway in their mind. This could perhaps be the first people in line for the first mention of the prosperity gospel. We know from the Gospel of John, for example, that many people follow Jesus just to see bread appear out of nowhere, just to see the miraculous, just to see the spectacular, just to see the amazing. So we don't know what this crowd was there for. Maybe they're just interested. But there they are. And so he stayed by the seashore. So he was waiting to see what was going to happen. And one of the synagogue officials, verse 22. Now the synagogue officials were very, very important people. These were not the hoi polloi of the crowd. This was a very important, prominent man named Jairus. Very high up. He had much to be accounted for. Many people knew him, and he was very well respected. Very powerful. Perhaps very wealthy. But you know what we know most about him from this story? 
The thing that stands out above all things is that Jairus was very desperate. He was very desperate. Desperate for what? For none other than Jesus Himself. And that's what makes him stand out. That's what we know Jairus for, was his desperation for the Lord Jesus Christ. He came up and on seeing him, fell at his feet. This is not how prominent officials act, is it? It would be like a member of the Senate, or a member of Congress, or a state representative coming and, and falling down in utter desperation. Well, what was his problem? He implored him earnestly, 23, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. You see, those of us who have children, we understand that it doesn't matter where we are in our station in life. If something is happening to our children, we will, we will go to the dust to see them get well, won't we? We will do anything it takes. We will lower ourselves as low as we need to to make sure that our children are taken care of. And so he didn't appeal to his name. He didn't appeal to his position. He did not appeal to his power. He only had one person to appeal to, and that was Jesus himself. Good grief. Another example where Jesus is the center of everything, right? Amen. We just keep seeing this over and over and over again. It is all about Him. It is not about us. It's never been about us. It's always been about Him. And so He is desperate. Please, He knows. He has heard the stories of this wonder-working man. He says, you can heal her. If you come and heal and lay your hands on her, she will get well and live. His faith was in the right place, wasn't it? His faith was in the right person. He begged Jesus to come, and so he went off with him. Jesus didn't have to do that, right? He is still Lord. He is still God. There are many people, and you have to remember this as you read the stories of Jesus, there are many people that Jesus did not heal. He did not heal them, but he goes with them. And they're all going together as a large crowd. They just want to be where the action is. And then we find the interruption. This is the story within a story. You know the story very well. Verse 25. On the way, okay, this is along the road as they're doing this, as they're going to this little girl's house. 25 says, a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I want us to see how glorious and how beautiful this story is. This is my prayer every week that I'll be able to do some justice to the glory of what is happening here. What I didn't notice until recently was how similar the stories are between Jairus and his daughter and his desperation and this woman and her desperation. Now, those of you who've read ahead, how old is Jairus' daughter? She's 12. How long has this woman had this bleeding condition? 
12 years. She has had this incurable disease for as long as the girl has been alive. And she started having it when Jesus was perhaps 20 years old. Think about how long that is. What were you doing 12 years ago? What disease did you have 12 years ago that was snuffed out in an instant probably and you haven't thought about it since? Well, this woman did not have the healing. Remember that the ways of the ancient Near East are pretty much nothing like today in the medical field. In those days, you went and you tried to get healing, you tried to get better, but there was absolutely nothing guaranteeing it. Most people died in early ages because of some sickness or some illness they had contracted along the way. People did not live to be very old in those days. There, were no, there was no modern medicine until, in fact, it was only the 1890s that people started learning that there are things called germs that cause disease and how to cure these things. And so she had a hemorrhage for 12 years. And that was not just the worst of it. She was in Jewish territory as a Jew, and bleeding causes one to become unclean. Unclean. This was in the law of Moses. If there is a bleeding, there is an uncleanliness. And so she had had a constant hemorrhage for 12 years. She could not be near people according to the law of Moses. It never would stop for her. If it had stopped, she could cleanse and go back to normal. But it never stopped. It never stopped. And even worse, she had endured much at the hands of many physicians. Many doctors, many attempted cures, but nothing worked. In fact, in all the money that she spent on the cure, the only thing that happened was that she got worse. That's what verse 26 tells us. This is desperation, folks. How many of you understand what kind of a desperation this woman is in? When you're at rock bottom. You know what? Jesus loves to meet us at rock bottom. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that He is so near when every, every one of our resources is totally gone? That's exactly where Jairus was. That's exactly where this woman was. These are not two unrelated stories. This is not some random event that Mark just threw in to save paper. No, they go hand in hand. Two desperate people. And they have nothing that can help them. So they come desperately to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 27, after hearing about Jesus. Oh, she knew. She had heard the story. She, like Jairus, had known about this healer. She came up in the crowd behind him, jostling around many, many people, and she simply touched his cloak. Let me tell you what this was. This was faith. It was not perfect faith. It may have been a little bit superstitious, but let's face it. When you came to Christ in faith, it was probably a little superstitious too. It was not perfect. Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, then amazing, miraculous things can happen. Jesus doesn't need our faith to be perfect. It just needs, He just wants our faith to be in Him. That's what she was doing. She wasn't touching John's cloak or James's cloak or some random guy's cloak. She was touching his cloak because in her mind, even if I touch his garments, I will get well. Yes, it sounds a little magical, but in her mind, that was her way of reaching out in faith. If I just reach out and touch his garment, I will get well. And that's exactly what happened. The healing miraculous power of Jesus was felt, not gradually, but again, Mark's favorite word, immediately. Eothus, he uses it all over the book of Mark. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up. And, beyond that, she felt in her body 
that she was healed of her affliction. It felt different on the inside like that. That is again how Jesus heals. We need to remember this, especially when we want to watch those religious stations on TV. When Jesus heals, it's the real thing, folks. You don't find Jesus healing someone and saying, how do you feel? <laughs> oh, I'm feeling much better. I'm sure I'll be fine in a few weeks. No. His healing was permanent. It was complete. It was irreversible. And it was instantaneous. It was the real thing. It was total. And that's exactly what happened to her. All of those doctors were quacks. They were false. She came to the great physician, didn't she? She came to the great physician. She realized in her desperation, she wised up and said, the only one that's going to help me is here in this crowd. If I just get up to his cloak and hang on to it, that's enough. It makes me wonder sometimes, when we want to do all that we can do, and even some things that we can't do, and we finally say, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. What's the use of that? Why don't we say, oh, I have a problem, I'm praying. Amen. First thing, right? Why don't we just wise up and go to the only one who can help the thing, right? Let's go to Jesus. These are, by the way, examples of faith. These are examples of faith. The New Testament is about Jesus. We can learn much from these who encountered Jesus Absolutely desperate, absolutely rock bottom. They met the Savior and they were completely changed. Completely changed. And so Jesus perceiving, verse 30, in himself that the power had gone from him, had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Now, did Jesus have to do this? Not necessarily. Again, he is Lord. But you have to study and learn why did Jesus do every little thing he did. There's a reason for this, folks. He didn't just do it to single her out or to embarrass her. He was, he was doing this for a reason. What was that reason? Well, look ahead. His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? And you say, Who touched me? You know, the disciples again are saying, good grief, Jesus, don't you get it? Don't you understand? This is a crowd of people, and everybody's touching you. They're trying to correct and inform Jesus, which is ridiculous. And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. Now, by the way, she didn't say, oh, Lord, it's me. He looked around and he found her. He knew who it was. Amen. Did Jesus ask who was it that touched me to gain information? No. no. Who created this woman? Jesus did. God the Son created and knows this woman. He said, my, I know my sheep by name. Amen. That's right. He knew her. He didn't have to ask, raise your hand if I healed you today. But he said, who touched my garments... Just like God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Did God, knew, did, did God know where they were? Yes, He did. Parents, have you ever said to your child, what did you do when you already knew it? What was the point of that? Why would you say, what have you done if you already know? Well, that's the same thing happening here. Daughter... Come out of the crowd. He wanted her to come and present herself to the crowd, not to embarrass her. Now get that. Not to single her out, to make her feel terrible, but to demonstrate something. People knew who this woman was, right? She had a reputation in the community. He wanted to do something. And the woman, verse 33, was, was afraid, fearing and, and, and trembling. Gosh, do you see another pattern here? When people have an encounter with Christ, whether it's on the open sea or seeing him change a demon-possessed man to a regular guy, what do people do? Do they get all chipper and say, well, gosh, gee shucks, that's a neat guy? No. They become very much afraid. 
That's what she did. She's fearing and trembling. No one's ever touched God's garment before, have they? And lived. It says that she was fearing and trembling, verse 33, because she was aware of what had happened to her. Not just the healing, but Jesus looking at her and saying, Come on out. Who touched me? And so he came, or she came rather, and fell down before him. You see how this is like Jairus again? They fell down before him, which is the only proper posture for a person to have toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're looking at the ground, that's the right place to be in the presence of Jesus. So she came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This must have been horrible for her, agonizing, but she couldn't help it. She couldn't leave out anything, could she? She told him how 12 years ago she had this disease. She told him how she felt. She felt alone and isolated and looked down upon by everybody. No doubt she told him that for 12 years she had suffered. She says, it simply says in three words, the whole truth. He knew it all, of course, but Jesus wanted to make everyone aware of what was going on. Verse 34 is astounding. And I wish that you could see this in the original Greek language. This is what it says in the literal Greek. He said to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. You. Jesus did many, many healings in the land of Israel, didn't he? Many healings. Not all that were physically healed were spiritually saved. Many people had enough faith to get physically healed, but not many, not as many, had enough faith to become spiritually healthy. This is what Jesus is saying to her. He is saying, your faith is of such a sort that your body is healed and your sins are forgiven. And that's what it's all about, right? If her body was healed, she would still succumb to death one day anyway. But Jesus that day gave her a much greater gift than healing her from 12 years of affliction. And look at what he calls her. He says, daughter. Can you imagine that? that? That is an endearing, tender term right there. Folks, let me tell you something that may not be obvious to you, but before Jesus Christ came into the world, women were not treated very well at all. And it was not Hinduism that changed that. It was not Islam that changed that. It was certainly not scientism or secularism that changed that. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ looking at this Savior who did unimaginable things like talk to a woman and bless a woman that changed the world. They don't teach that in school, but it's the absolute truth. Before Christianity came along, women were treated as property. Dignity came, dignity to women and men and the oppressed was restored by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that here. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And she did. She left physically healed and spiritually whole. She got the best that day. I imagine she talked about that day the rest of her life. Do you think? Now we finish the story in verse 35. Verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, that is Jairus, saying, Your daughter has died. Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher? <coughs> this is the worst news he could have received, right? Some of you have received that news about your children. And I can't tell you that I know what that's like. But that's the worst nightmare of any parent, isn't it? To hear the news that this happened to your little girl or your little boy. There'll always be a little girl, right? Little boy, always. 
The nightmare had come true. And so they said to Jairus, leave him alone. Leave the teacher alone. There's nothing more he can do. There's nothing he can do. She, she is already dead. You can't do anything to a dead person. I mean, yes, he can get demons out of a deranged man. He can get rid of leprosy. He can stop bleeding. Oh, of course, he's a miracle-working master, but nobody can help you once you're dead. So they said, leave him alone. Dead is dead. What does Jesus say? Not so fast. But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, literally, do not be afraid. Only keep on believing. That's the literal Greek. Don't be afraid. Just keep on believing. Isn't that great? Don't be afraid. The most commonly worded command in the Scripture from Jesus, don't be afraid, but keep on believing. Now wait, that's strange. What is, what is he talking about? Jairus, no doubt that Jesus could take care of her while she's sick. He knew that he could do amazing, miraculous things. But Jairus must have been thinking, what do you mean, Lord? I believe, but this is ridiculous. Dead. She's dead. She's gone. Verse 37, he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And I'll talk about these three in just a moment. He excluded nine disciples and brought only three for a very important lesson for them. And they would need this. So he just brought the three, the, the three that are closest to him, Peter, James, and John, they came into the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. Now what is that for? This is the funeral. Funerals in the ancient Near East and funerals like in Buddhist lands are exactly the opposite of what they are here. Funerals typically in the ancient world are very, very loud. They're making a lot of racket. Uh, in Buddhist lands, they do this to scare off the evil spirits. We're not used to that, are we? In the ancient Jewish world, they did this to kind of whip up the crowd and to ex exert some sense of grief. It's, to, it's essentially trying to pull the grief out of people to get them to go ahead and express their misery. But here in America, we're just very quiet. It's very reverent, you know? Most of the time. We just, we just sit in silence. We just listen to quiet music. And, and in a way, we're almost trying to forget about our grief. But in the ancient Near East, it was not like that. They wanted to bring out the grief. They even hired professional wailers at funerals. And so people were wailing loudly. And so, 39, entering in, Jesus coming into the house, He said to them, the strangest thing, right? Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. What? Jesus, are you serious? And that's exactly what they said. Verse 40, they all began laughing at him. They thought he was crazy. Now you tell me, who knows more? The people in that house or Jesus? <laughs> Who knows, who knows theology and truth better? Obviously Jesus does. What is he saying here? This is a loaded statement. He's saying that she is not dead. She's not gone to be in the other world. She's not left this life. She's simply asleep. He's saying a lot of things there. Even some theological things there. But let's look at what happens. They begin laughing at him, but... Putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, that is Peter, James, and John, and he entered the room where the child was. So they were laughing at him in derision, in scorn. They were making fun of Jesus because they thought he didn't know what he was talking about. Just like today, right? Many, many people will laugh at Jesus. But like Keith Green said, the funniest thing he's done was love a rebellious world like this one. 
They laughed at him. He put them out. He said, you have rejected me. You have uh, you've forsaken the right to see this, so leave. <laughs> but he kept the three with him and the mother and father. And he entered the room where the child was. Verse 41. Again, he can heal the sick. He can cast out demons, but de dead is dead. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely, completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. What a Savior. What a Savior. How many times have you been to a funeral in which the person sits up in the casket and says, I'm back? That just doesn't happen, does it? What happens when Jesus is around is unusual, isn't it? We forget that while we might place limits on certain people's power, we might place limits on our ability or others' ability, there is no limit to Jesus' power. The only thing that Jesus won't do is what He's decided not to do. But let me tell you something. When He's decided to do something, there is nothing in the whole universe that can stop it from happening. When he says, little girl, get up, there's no way she would not have come back from the dead. And people have said, concerning John 11 and Lazarus who had died, if Jesus had not said the word Lazarus, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. If Jesus hadn't said Lazarus, every one of those dead bodies would have come out of the grave. Because that's how powerful he is. But this is, the, this is the master. Folks, why and how could you center your life on anything else? Your kids are great, but they don't do this. We need Jesus. We need to be desperate before him. And this is a perfect story about a ruler and an outcast who were both changed by the master's hand. This daughter was 12 years old. Interestingly enough, she was of marriage age, but she fell sick. And as we saw, she literally died. Well, that gives new meaning to the, what Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. She's just taking a nap. And she got up and began to walk. The word walk is, a, is more than just walk. It's walk around. Peri pateo. She got up and started walking around the room. Just getting it and energetically going all over the place. And, and Mark tells us she was 12 years old because he just wanted to let us know that she was old enough to walk. In verse 42, immediately they were completely astounded. Completely astounded. A lot can be said. I mean, he, Jesus spoke to her in a, a language called Aramaic that was the common language of the day. But I want to focus on that astounding. Because we're going to see that next week in chapter 6. That astonishment and amazement really marks the gospel of Mark. You don't see this, as I've said. You don't see this every day. You don't go around and see dead people come back to life. But Jesus has the power. Immediately they were astounded. They had never seen anything like this. And the reason we have it in the Gospel of Mark is because they couldn't stop talking about it. That's the nature of Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't just come to give you something to do. Jesus did not come into the world just to get you a ticket to heaven eventually after you live your life however you want to live it. That's not why He came. He didn't come even to make bad people good. You know what He did? 
He came to make dead people alive. And the Bible says of every single one of us that spiritually we were all dead. Dead. That's, a, that's, a, that's an absolute word. It means you do absolutely nothing for the glory and the love of God. Nothing. So when people say, I'm a good person, I say, wow, great. But the standard is, be perfect, as my heavenly Father is perfect. And only perfection can enter heaven. So what do you say about that? Only perfection can enter heaven. Why would God let anything imperfect into a perfect heaven? He doesn't. Well, good grief. How do we get there? We get perfection from someone else. Someone else. It is still the case that nothing imperfect has ever or will ever, in, in, will ever enter heaven. Nobody goes to heaven because they're good. Nobody. Because the fact is, nobody's good. The standard is God. The standard is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength every second of every day since you were born. That's the standard. If anyone's ever met that, they get to go to heaven. But none of us have. All of us. Spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Our hearts beat for anything else other than God. We live our lives for ourselves. We live our lives to please us. We do our own thing. All of these things are examples of what the Bible calls sin. Because of sin, we, des we do not desire God. We want what He gives, yes. We want His gifts. We want stuff. We want money. We want a family. We want what He gives, but we don't want Him. And that's the problem. He said, you will have no other gods before me. You will have no other desires and treasures and ultimate allegiances except God. That is the problem. The problem is not that we don't think we like God. The problem is that we don't want God. We want everything else. The Bible calls that sin. Jesus came into this sin-riddled world. Into a whole world that did not love God. And He said, I am the way to the Father. If you want to know what the Father is like, look at me. He came preaching the good news of the kingdom. He told people to do two things. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to turn around. It means to turn away from sin. To stop loving sin. To stop chasing sin. To stop wanting sin. And turn away from all that and run straight toward God. That's what faith is. Coming to Jesus Christ. And when we come, we forsake our sin. We run to the Savior. That is called spiritual life. That is called being born again. Jesus said in John 3, Unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. So we have to be born again through repentance and and faith. When that happens, just like this miracle of a girl coming back to life, we who truly believe in Christ become alive for the first time in our life. Amen. I hardly remember anything before May 5th, 1991. Why? Because on May 5th, 1991, I became alive. And stuff before that, I don't even hardly remember. And it hardly matters a bit to me. What matters to me is Christ and His kingdom and His purposes. And if you desire forgiveness, if you desire entrance into the kingdom, if you desire a real reason to live instead of just chasing what everyone else chases, then the answer is none other than Christ Himself. Won't you come to Him today? Won't you leave all that stuff behind and run, run desperately toward the Savior? I invite you to do that today. Let's pray together.